There is a lot of buzz these days about the term SD for software defined, like SD access or SD WAN. And in this video, I'd like to chat with you about two basic things. Number one, what is the big thing about SD WAN? Why is it so needed? How much does it really help us? And second is, <laughs> what the heck is going on with your hair today, Keith? What is up? So let's start with a scenario where we have like a headquarters site right here at site 10, and we have a site 20, site 30, site 40. These could be in you know different cities or even different countries, and we want the connectivity to be able to happen between them. Maybe there's a server here at site 10, and that needs to be reachable by the people over at site 20 or site 40 respectively. So <laughs> here's what we used to do a long, long time ago in a galaxy far away. I'm talking about 20 years ago. We would create IPsec tunnels where we wanted to secure the traffic. So this transport network here, that could be MPLS or the internet or basically any WAN carrier, frame relay if you're going way, way back in the time machine. But this is just a transport network that rep the cloud represents the connectivity that can exist between these four sites. So what we do is we would build IPsec tunnels. So IPsec is a, a framework of encryption to protect packets as they are cruising over network. And here's the tunnels we would build. We would build a tunnel, a site to site tunnel from site 20 to site 10. In doing that, it's pretty tricky because in the old days, we'd have to set up what's called a crypto ACL that identifies the source and destination traffic. And then we'd have to create a crypto map and a transform set and knit that all together and associate with the interface. There's a lot of configuration to get it to work. Now, that's just for one tunnel, <laughs> but we have more work to do here. So as we continue our discussion here, we'd also build an IPsec tunnel here between the 10.0.10 network and the 10.0.30 network between site 10 and site 30. And then we'd want an IPsec tunnel here between site 10 and site 40 uh, to tr protect the traffic from 10.0.10 .10 going down to 10.0.40 and vice versa. And this would be referred to as a logical hub and spoke because we have the hub up here and then there's remote connectivity down to these spokes. However, what if there was a server over here at site 30 that somebody at site 40 needed to get? Well, they would have to go over the IPsec tunnel to the headquarters location and then be redirected down. But <laughs> that is not as simple as it seems with the old school technology. In my CCA security exam, that is one of the tasks I had to do. It looked pretty simple, like a hub, three spokes, no problem. They're using firewalls for it. But still, what we have to do is identify, okay, from site 40, that's 10.0.40, destined to 10.0.30, and then at the hub, at the headquarters site, site 10, we'd have to configure the crypto ACL to match on that pat traffic pattern as well. It, it was a nightmare, no, not good, but it even gets worse. If we wanted a full mesh, we want site 40 to be able to talk to site 30 directly, that's again, more IPsec tunnel manual configuration. So that would look something like this, if we wanna do a full mesh like that, let's see if we have it all. Um, nope, we need one more right here. So the formula for a full mesh of anything is n, and then in parentheses, n minus 1 divided by 2. So that means if you have four sites, you do 4, and then 4 minus 1 divided by 2. So if we do the math on that, you do the stuff in parentheses first, that'd be 4 times 3 divided by 2. And then at that point, we just go left to right. So 4 times 3 is 12, divided by 2 is 6. So basically this says to get a full mesh of IPsec tunnels, we would use six tunnels, which is represented here. But what happens if we add two or three or four or five more sites? Now, today we have some horsepower where we can handle all those tunnels, but the manual configuration of all that is just almost undoable if we were going to do it manually with the old methods of doing it. So the question might come up, well, okay, Keith, that sounds like a lot of work, a lot of problem, and it is. How, how do we solve it? Alexa, stop. Oh my gosh, <laughs> she thinks I'm talking to her. All right, so that's a lot of work and a lot of hassle to get it done. So how does SD-WAN help us to overcome this currently if we have the SD-WAN solution from Cisco and other vendors also have a similar solution to this as well? The answer is we just in software define what we want, who we want to be able to communicate, what's route show up where, and it just rains down the configuration. Check this out. Now, what I'm about to show you is my topology where I've got like six or seven sites and I did not have to configure IPsec on any of them. Here's what I did with SD-WAN. I specified that I wanted these four devices to become part of my SD-WAN fabric. That basically is a fancy way of saying they're all participating. And then these guys came online. They checked with the controller, the management network. They got their configs. And then via a dynamic routing protocol called OMP, 
it automatically trained all these four devices on exactly who they should peer with, what keys they should use, and I didn't have to set up any of that. And yet the functionality is there. So if a device over here at site 10 wants to ping somebody over here at, let's say site 20, they can just go ahead and send that traffic. It would go to their default gateway, which is this edge device in our SD-WAN network. And this device, which is vEdge 10, would take that data, encrypt it, ship it directly over to device 20, who would decrypt it and then forward it to this PC. So as a test, let's imagine this PC it ends in dot 20. Its IP address is 10.0.20.20. And also one other term I want to share with you before I demo this is the concept of a VPN. Now, it's going to take a little bit of retraining on our parts to think differently about a VPN. So traditionally, like a decade or two decades ago, we talked about VPNs. A lot of times we think about an IPsec, like virtual private network, or a remote access virtual private network. In the context of SD-WAN, when you hear the word VPN, I'd like you to think of a group of routes. So if we wanted to include this network and this network and this network and this network in a group, like a group of routes, we could call that a VPN and we give it a number. Let's call it VPN 10. And that way, all these edge devices, they know that they are participating in VPN 10 and they know what routes are reachable in that VPN, which again, in this context, is simply talking about a group of routes. So as a demonstration, let's just hop over to this edge device on our SD-WAN network, which is vEdge 10. Let's take a look at the routes and then we'll try to ping a device over here on this 10.020 network. So here I am sitting at vEdge 10. If we did a show IP route, it's got quite a large routing table that was mostly populated by this routing protocol, OMP, the Overlay Management Protocol. Think of OMP like the, uh, the protocol, the language of love, between all the edge devices and the controller devices, which are up in the cloud. And we'll have a separate video just on vSmart and how that works. But if we hit the space bar a few times, there's lots of routes. And also notice over here on the left, that's representing the VPN number. So this is basically all the routes that are part of VPN 10, which is a group of routes. And here is 10.0.20 right there. So vEdge 10 says, hey, if I need to get to 10.0.20.anything, as part of this group of routes called VPN 10, I can do it. I'll simply follow the instructions based on my routing table. And if we did a show IPsec outbound connections, this is gonna show us all of the IPsec tunnels that are currently in place between this vEdge device, like a router at the edge of our SD-WAN network and the other edges that it may need to communicate with. So the benefit is all these IPsec tunnels are dynamically built. We don't have to manually do any of them. And then if we send traffic, it's gonna automatically encrypt and send that traffic protected over the IPsec tunnel. So I'm gonna do a ping. I'm gonna source this from VPN 10 because it has several different groups of routes that it can use. And I'm gonna ping the IP address of 10.0.20.20, which is over off of site 20. We'll press enter and there it goes. Now that's being encrypted and protected courtesy of IPsec as it goes from this device, this edge device over to the edge device at site 20. And you know what'd be cool? Let's go ahead and let me do a capture for us as well. So let's do the ping again. And this time I'm gonna go ahead and make it a little bit bigger. That way when we see it in the packet capture, we can say, oh yeah, there you go. Those are the pings. I'm gonna go ahead and send it at a thousand. There'll be a little bit of overhead, but this will help differentiate it so we can say, oh yeah, those packets that are being sent from VH10 to VH20, they are being protected by IPsec. And here is the capture of that traffic. Now I put a display filter right here. It said, please only show me where you have frames that are equal to or greater than a thousand. And so all of these are the conversations, the pings and the replies between uh, the VH10, which is at 162.16.10.10. That's its IP address over the cloud network, the transport network. And 162.16.10.20 is VH20's IP address that's reachable over the cloud network, over the transport network. Now, in the past, traditionally, we'd see IPsec as protocol 50 at layer four, but look at this, it's UDP. And so what happens is that IPsec is actually being encapsulated and then hidden behind a UDP header. And one of the benefits of SD-WAN is that not only did we have the management, the control network rain down this information to the edge devices saying, hey, here's your information for the tunnels, but they also rain down the keys to involve and the ports to use. So when VH10 wanted to talk to VH20 and forward an encrypted packet, it had all the keys, all the routes, all the information needed. It just encrypted it, shipped it over, and VH20 decrypted it and forwarded it on to the final destination. So another logical question would be, okay, with SD-WAN, 
Uh, who is exactly raining down all this information regarding the routing and the VPN information and the keys involved? Where's that coming from? It's coming from a controller network. And in that controller network, there's a specific device that's in charge of raining down or sending all that detail to all of the edge devices. And that device has a name and it is vSmart. And if you wanna know more about vSmart and how that plays this role, we'll have a short video coming up on that next. So thanks for joining me and I'll see you in the next video. Enough.